Well, thank you very much. And uh, it is a real pleasure to be uh, addressing this summer school uh, today. Uh, as you heard, I do have a, an interest in economics. It was uh, born at school during my uh, A-level studies. It was uh, nurtured in a philosophy, politics, and economics uh, degree. And it was embedded during 11 years of actually teaching um, A-level uh, economics. And that's the reason why I'm delighted to be addressing those of you who are current economics students. However, I have to say, the nearly 20 years since I did any uh, proper uh, economics is the reason why I probably will have more in common with those of you who are doing the principles of economics for non-economics uh, course. But I have to say, those uh, 20 years since I've properly uh, studied or taught economics haven't been completely wasted. Um, I was in Parliament, I had a 10-year ministerial career, as you've heard, so I had the chance to consider the economic and political forces that were acting on some of the big, biggest public policy issues of the day. And that's why, in this lecture, I will be considering how those forces have formed the British National Health Service, the successes the problems with that internationally unique model for delivering healthcare, and whether or not it's a model that is actually sustainable into the future. And as well as economic ideas, I will also draw on my experience, as you've heard, from one of my uh, new roles since I left political life. I am now the chair of the University Hospitals Birmingham NHS Trust. It's an internationally recognised uh, teaching hospital, now operating from the largest single site private finance initiative hospital building in the country with world leading cancer services, the largest transplant program in Europe. Uh, it could be the largest transplant uh, service in the world, but we always slightly wonder whether or not China may have overtaken us. Uh, at some point or another. It's home to the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine, which means that we treat all of the UK and, so, and quite a lot of international military who have returned from action. We also had the honour to look after the uh, inspirational Malala Yousafzai. Uh, you may remember she was the young girl who stood up to and was shot by the Taliban in Pakistan for demanding the right for girls to be educated. And she's now campaigning for girls' rights across the world. So we're proud of our hospital. But we're not alone uh, in the UK. A recent uh, opinion poll carried out by Ipsos Mori asked people what made them the most proud to be British. The National Health Service was the top answer. It came above our royal family and the armed forces. And if you've spent any time at all in the UK, you'll know that our royal family and our armed forces are quite important to us. But above that, in terms of what makes us proud, is the National Health Service. So it's become a central institution in the UK. It celebrated its 67th birthday a few weeks ago on the 5th of July. Most of us, born or brought up in the UK, take the model, its benefits and its problems, for granted. A few years ago, I was in holiday with my family uh, in Portugal, and my father, unfortunately, needed an emergency appendix uh, operation. And as the bill for his treatment ticked up through the operation and the care that he was having, first of all, I realised how important it was to have holiday insurance. And secondly, how much we, those of us who live in the UK, take the free access to healthcare that the National Health Service provides for granted. But it's worthwhile reminding ourselves, therefore, what this country was like for many before the National Health Service. And here, for example, are the words of a woman who remembers her childhood before the NHS. And she says, when we were little, you had to pay to see the doctor. He'd give you a treatment, then a bill. Lots of people didn't go because they couldn't afford it. You only really used the doctor if it was something serious. 
I remember my twin sister Gladys had a bad leg and she didn't go to school for a year. She never saw a doctor, it was just too expensive. We'd try and cure ourselves instead. Everybody had a home remedy for something. My granddad didn't have teeth or glasses. Even though he had bad eyesight, he just couldn't afford it. It was the same for everyone who was poor. If you couldn't afford it, you didn't get it. Now, the genesis of the National Health Service in the UK stretches back, actually, into the 19th century. Whilst much health care was provided by hospital charities, supported by the benevolent individuals and foundations, some councils, like the London County Council, had the ambition to run hospitals as well as utilities. And early socialists, like Beatrice Webb, who uh, with her husband formed the Fabian Society in the UK, argued in the 1900s for a state system of health care. But it wasn't until much later, after the Second World War, that the system came together. And several factors in that immediate post-war period led us in the UK to believe that the National Health Service was the right answer, or at the least that there needed to be major reform in the way in which we delivered health. Firstly, the emergence of the view that healthcare was a right, not something bestowed erratically by charity. There were financial difficulties for those voluntary hospitals dependent on charities and individuals. The war ensured the creation of an emergency medical service as part of the war effort, which provided an example of how a command and control system could operate in healthcare. The cataclysmic effects of having gone through that period of war made it possible to have a massive change in the system of providing healthcare rather than simply a process of incremental reform. And there was an increasing view amongst younger members of the uh, medical profession that there was a better way of doing things, of delivering healthcare. And in a groundbreaking report in 1942 on social welfare, Beveridge identified what he called the five giant evils in society. He identified them as squalor, ignorance, want, idleness, and disease. And he put forward a, a range of proposals for the welfare system, which still forms the basis of our welfare system in the UK uh, now. And whilst he didn't identify the precise nature or funding of a health service, he nevertheless saw one as essential to a satisfactory system of social welfare and to tackling that evil of disease. There were differing views on how the system should be reformed, but in 1945, Health Minister Anaya and Bevan presented a radical plan which involved the nationalisation of all hospitals, voluntary or council, and for the first time, hospitals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, opticians and dentists were brought together under one umbrella organisation to provide services that are free for everybody at the point of delivery. So the central principles of our National Health Service were born and were clear. The health service will be available to all, financed entirely from taxation, which means that people pay into it according to their means, and it is available to them free at the point at which they need it. This is Anaya Bevin, Nye as uh, we call him in the UK, Nye Bevin, celebrating the first day of the National Health Service, a system that he described as being set up in place of fear. Some charges for prescriptions and for dental work were introduced in the early 1950s, but otherwise the fundamental model remains the same today, notwithstanding the fact that there have been lots of reorganisations of the management and the machinery and the bureaucracy of the health service. Equally, many of the tensions of the early days of the NHS have challenged its senior management and governments ever since, challenge us at the hospital that I now lead. The fundamental questions that tested Nye Bevan and his colleagues how best to organise and manage the service, how to fund it 
adequately, how to balance the often conflicting demands and expectations of patients and staff and taxpayers, how to ensure finite resources are targeted where they most are needed. Those questions remain the key questions for the National Health Service today as well, because at its heart, the NHS is a model to answer the fundamental question of economics. How should we allocate scarce resources in, health, in the healthcare system? Many could argue that it is actually a remarkably successful way of making the rationing of scarce resources socially and politically acceptable. Bevan himself recognised that. He addressed the Royal College uh, of Nursing uh, back in the 1940s and he said, we shall never have all we need. Expectations will always exceed capacity. The service must always be changing, growing and improving. It must always appear inadequate. So looking back on 67 years of the National Health Service, how should we assess the strengths and weaknesses of the model? Well, we have some help in doing this. A recent study by the Commonwealth Fund, which is a privately funded US-based health research organization, compared the performance of the US healthcare system with 10 other developed countries, including the UK, using measures of quality of care, access, efficiency, equity, and the extent to which there is a healthy society and people live healthy lives. And here were its conclusions. And for reasons that will become very obvious to you soon, I love this slide. Firstly, because on quality of care, the first category, the UK ranks number one on all measures. Now, we can't only, of course, attribute this to the NHS. The quality of care offered in our health system is also influenced by the excellence of our medical training, the quality of research and research institutions in the UK, places like Warwick University, for example. And therefore, of course, because of that excellence, our ability to be able to attract some of the most effective clinicians and researchers internationally. However, I would argue that there are features of the National Health Service, which make it easier to deliver that quality care. In one system, it's much easier for clinicians to share information. National organisations that we've set up as part of the National Health Service, like uh, the National Institute of, of, for Health and Clinical Excellence, has a role to ensure that treatments and drugs can be assessed for their efficacy and their efficiency. And then those recommendations can be implemented throughout the system. On access, you'll see the UK ranks first. And this, of course, confounds those people who believe and argue that a market mechanism is necessary to ensure the effective allocation of resources. Uh, sorry, on access, the UK ranks first overall, and we'll come to efficiency in a minute. Now, you might expect that because it provides universal free access. The rationing mechanism has tended to be waiting lists, and despite very considerable reductions in waiting times over the last 10 years, that's perhaps whilst why we are only third in terms of the timeliness of care. So in other words, we have a system that provides wide access to care, free at the point of need, but quite often you have to wait for it. And that's the mechanism that has been used to ration care. On efficiency, the NHS ranks first. And that confounds the, uh, those that argue that the market mechanism is the only efficient way to allocate resources and to reduce the costs of production. In fact, I would argue the NHS enables many of the problems of insurance-based healthcare systems, which tends to be the model in most other uh, countries. It enables us to avoid some of the problems that those healthcare systems have. Doctors are either salaried or they're under contract to the National Health Service. 
They're not normally paid a fee for service for NHS work. In doing that, we avoid the oversupply problems of producer moral hazard. We avoid supplier-induced demand, which can exist in other systems. One of the inefficiencies in many other systems comes from the overuse of expensive specialist services as patients present themselves to those specialists first. The NHS has a system of general practitioners, family doctors, who act as both a guide to the appropriate specialist, but also as a filter. That helps to overcome the problems of consumer ignorance. It provides a means of controlling the level of demand on the most expensive parts of the system. If you even spent any time at all looking at UK newspapers and news, you would know that there is quite often frustration at the problems with getting an appointment to see your general practitioner or your family doctor. But nevertheless, GPs are playing an important role in preventing patients with easily treatable illnesses clogging up the lists, uh, the queues of expensive specialists. And that's why many other countries are looking to the NHS and trying to develop similar systems. For example, GP-based primary care has been an export from the National Health Service to India, which does in fact seem right, as many of our GPs actually came to the UK from India to contribute to the National Health Service. On equity, you will see once again the UK ranks highest. Now, in one way, that isn't surprising in a system that is built on the principle of universal access for all, free at the point of need. That is not, however, to say that there are not considerable issues of equality and inequality in our healthcare provision in the UK. A one-person family doctor practice, for example, in a dilapidated inner city premises is not going to be providing the quality of care that I take for granted in the multi-GP, multi-purpose clinic that I am able to attend. Infant mortality is linked to those mothers who've got the education and the wherewithal to access antenatal care. There are stark differences in life expectancy depending on income levels and geography. And those go some way to explaining why in an otherwise excellent report, as you will see in the very last category, if you look at our ranking, you know, we are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 3, 1, 2. In the last category, healthy lives, we are nearly at the bottom in terms of performance. And I will come back to that crucial issue later. But the bottom line, literally, of this table gives us perhaps the greatest reason for satisfaction about the National Health Service. It's part of our political and public discussion in the UK that the NHS is just too expensive. We can't, in the current situation, afford to carry on running the system in the way in which we do. But what the per capita figures at the bottom show is that we provide the best healthcare system at the second lowest per capita cost behind only New Zealand. Now I'll come back to this tricky issue of funding a little bit later. But suffice to say, this international position actually provides a considerable economic opportunity for us in terms of exporting some of the lessons of the NHS. The Economist recently reported on the work in countries as diverse as China, India, Mexico and South Africa to forge national health provision for relatively piecemeal setups. At a health conference in South Africa, several speakers referred to establishing the National Health Service as their holy grail. Because with large populations and tight budgets, many developing countries are attracted to the NHS's relatively cheap per person coverage. And although many emerging co economies also want to keep private insurance schemes, they relish the NHS's emphasis on fairness towards poorer people. Julio Frank, a former Mexican health minister, uh, praises the British approach for breaking the link between earnings and health entitlements. 
This is a problem, of course, for insurance-based systems because premiums are often linked to people's wages or to their employment. And it's a particular problem, therefore, where there are large populations outside regular paid employment. As Frank says, if you have to wait until they all get regular jobs, you'll wait too long. But I'm a fan of the National Health Service, but what about its challenges and its downsides? Well, firstly, whilst the cost of the NHS most certainly compares favourably internationally, it is nevertheless a cost which is rising steeply and which is now taking a considerably larger share of our GDP. In 1974, NHS spending constitutionally 4.6% of GDP. This peaked at the end of the uh, Labour government in uh, 2010 at over 9%. Although it's now falling back, in 2011-12, the cost of the NHS was still £134 billion. Pounds. So why has that cost increased so much? Well, firstly, the rate of inflation faced by the National Health Service is considerably higher than the overall rate. If we compare a GDP deflator index with an NHS pay and prices index, with a base year of 1974-75, when the index was obviously 100, by 2012, the GDP deflator stood at just under 600, while the NHS pay and prices index was 1,200. And there is no suggestion that that disparity of increased costs is going to close in the future. A particular cost pressure for many NHS providers is their workforce. A combination of poor workforce planning and restrictions on immigration mean that labour supply is insufficient in the NHS. And frankly, it doesn't take an economist to have predicted that the impact of that would be a big growth in the use of much more expensive temporary and agency care and workforce. That is a major cost pressure. But secondly, alongside cost, the demand for care provided by the NHS is also increasing rapidly. Firstly, we have more people living longer, and we can do more for them. The system has to treat more than a third more people than it did when it started in 1948. By 2051, projections suggest that that will be more than 50% more people than the system was set up for. The good news is that we all have the chance to live a lot longer now than we did previously. The NHS is a victim of its own success, you could argue. In fact, you could argue more than healthcare across the world is a victim of its own success in keeping people alive for longer. People live on average 10 years longer now than they did when the NHS was formed. We treat people at the QE, at our hospital, for long-term conditions who would previously have died in childhood. We look after older people who survived the heart attack or the cancer that would have killed previous generations. But of course, they're now living with a range of long-term health conditions. Long-term health conditions, rather than illnesses that are susceptible to a one-off set of treatment, now take up 70% of the health service budget in the UK. In a visit to the operating theatres uh, recently, I chatted with a patient who was about to undergo a gallstone uh, operation. She was well into her 70s. She had diabetes. Now, I can tell you that 12, 13 years ago, when I was a health minister, she would probably not even have been considered for treatment. So this is good news. We're living longer and we've got more access to healthcare treatment, but it does mean a greater demand on our health services. And developments in healthcare mean more opportunities to treat people. At the QE, we now transplant more than one person with one liver. Live donors mean that our kidney transplants have increased from about 100 a year to over 350 a year. And there's interesting research that shows that when you start, for example, a renal dialysis program in a country that previously has not had one, 
you have a pattern where the death rate from renal failure instantly reduces. And that continues for a number of years. But of course, it's not immortality treatment. And the death rate then rises to its previous level as people who have been kept alive on dialysis for years then die from chronic renal failure or other illnesses. Now, all of those pressures mean that funding, the levels that we spend on the NHS, are a topic of constant concern and political battle. Uh, those of you who had anything to do with our recent general election will have seen that the issue of the National Health Service and the amount of money that politicians were willing to pledge for it was a major political question during the election. Critics of the NHS model are split. Some have tried to argue that the inefficiency of a command and control model actually leads to lower productivity and inefficiency. I have to say, it does become harder to stand that critique up in the light of the international comparison that I showed you. Others would argue from a very different uh, viewpoint that the NHS has actually resulted in insufficient resources being devoted to healthcare. There is less care than consumers would actually like because funding the service from taxation means that there's no mechanism whereby consumers can signal their willingness to pay more. According to that view then, the UK spends less of its GDP on healthcare than other developed countries. That re reflects not a strength of the system, but a weakness of the NHS rather than evidence of its efficiency. Last year, the uh, National Health Service England published a five-year plan which suggested that due to some of the pressures that I've outlined, the NHS would actually need £30 billion more simply to provide the same level of care by 2020. And of course, there are only three ways to deal with that gap. Either you address demand, and of course, uh, in helping people to avoid needing healthcare treatment is an important way of doing it. I'll return to that later. Or you make the NHS more efficient, and there are very tough targets being placed on us at the moment to become more efficient. Or you increase the funding level. And one of the conclusions of the election was actually a promise by every political party to fund the NHS by £8 billion uh, more. But there are also arguments about how that funding should actually be delivered. Some people think we should have another rise in our national insurance, effectively, uh, a tax, an income tax in the UK, and hypothecate it as funding for the National Health Service. Some people think we should allow further charging. There are some people who've suggested a charge to go and see or register with a family doctor. A, uh, in my view, a ludicrous uh, suggestion, which I'm more than happy to expand on in questions if you want to pursue that. And of course, a, a further erosion or an erosion of that fundamental principle of the NHS that it is free at the point of need. Another problem that some identify with the NHS model is that it's not really sensitive to consumer preference, not only in terms of the amount of resource allocated, to healthcare, but doctors, for example, have got considerable independence and clinical autonomy. They sometimes make decisions about patients' treatment with very little reference to either the patients or, in fact, the managerial structure of the NHS. But we have made some changes to the command and control model of the NHS to try and recognise the need to give more power to those who are consuming health services. So we've introduced a system where patients with their GP can choose where they want to be treated. They can choose between different uh, hospitals. When people have got long-term conditions, we've tried to develop the idea <coughs> that they are expert patients, that they have a bit more control over the way that they're treated. Some have suggested the idea that there should be personal care budgets for people with long-term conditions. So that instead of somebody else making a decision about how public money is spent on your care, you control a sum of money that represents what would be spent on your care and you choose whether or not you want 
more physiotherapy or whether or not you want somebody to come and support you in your home or whether or not you want a different sort of, of treatment. In other words, the power comes away from the system and to the individual. However, what's also very clear is despite the introduction of some choice to consumers and patients, the NHS, um, whilst working to increase that patient choice, does not allow the consequences of the choice to then work through the system. For example, we've seen a big demand for our services at the Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital due to our good reputation. In a freer market, of course, we would respond to that by increasing our capacity or by taking over a competitor. Neither of those things are possible. So the risk is that the very quality which attracts new patients to us might actually undermine that quality because we can't expand. Let me turn now to that issue about healthy uh, lives that uh, we saw um, uh, represented in the uh, Commonwealth Institute uh, research. A major problem for the National Health Service is that it's fundamentally misnamed. It's actually a very successful national illness service. It has never taken the need for or the opportunities for better public health or prevention seriously enough. That's one of the factors which makes demand for health services actually so difficult to control. Of course, that's partly because uh, what makes us healthy is not only in the hands of health professionals, it's local councils and housing associations who ensure that our housing is good quality. It's the food industry who increase the fat and sugar in our food. It's the tobacco industry which promotes smoking. And it's the government and the revenue services who ban it in public places or who tax people out of it. But see, it's the NHS which picks up the pieces. One in five adults in the UK still smokes. A third of people drink too much alcohol. A third of men and half of women don't get enough exercise. Almost two thirds of adults are overweight or obese. So as the stock of population health risk gets worse, the flow of costly NHS treatments increases. A charity in the UK that looks after people with diabetes, Diabetes UK, estimates that the NHS is already spending £10 billion a year on treating diabetes. Now remember I said the estimate is that there'll be a £30 billion shortfall by uh, 2020. So a third of that shortfall could be addressed by dealing better with the sorts of factors that lead people to get diabetes. But changing people's behaviour in all of these areas is also an issue, I think, where economics has something uh, to offer. It may well be something that you have strong views or ideas about. In some countries, I think Mexico and South Africa are examples, they've developed schemes of conditional cash transfers to encourage the country's poorest people to look after their health or to offer discounts on wholesome food in return for attending the gym. Governments of all persuasions in the UK expect us as NHS providers to take on the tough decisions whilst they actually try to avoid them themselves. And I have to hold my hand up and say I was responsible when I was in government as well. We're now expected at the QE to transplant livers for people who are alcoholics. But the government avoids minimum pricing for alcohol which may well help to avoid people having liver disease in the first place. More than one in ten of our patients at the hospital also has diabetes. But action on healthier food is left to the willingness of food manufacturers and retailers to put different colours on their labels. What else could we do to ensure that people in the UK and in fact across the world are more healthy? I think the age of voluntary approaches and simply providing information are over and we need to find more robust ways of dealing with that. But given all of those problems, why am I nevertheless still optimistic about the future for the NHS? Why do I still think it's the right model? Well, firstly, because whilst many of the problems that I've talked about are actually pretty widespread in developed and developing countries, it's the NHS model 
which provides many of the factors needed to solve them more effectively than insurance models found elsewhere. We've come an enormous way in terms of our use of the best and most advanced technology in the NHS, but there is still more that we can do. The availability of public investment, the scale of the NHS, and as I touched on earlier, the ability to spread best practice across a large uh, system ensures that we're able to adopt new techniques and new technologies quickly, giving the NHS particular benefits. We're able to adopt modern technology. The Department of Health in the UK is looking at how we can do what they call M Health, mobile health, where you diagnose and monitor your health through the use of a mobile phone. Despite the pitfalls with IT systems, our Secretary of State for Health wants to make Britain the leading country when it comes to the use of data about patients. At the QE, we have world-leading informatics, which enables us to minimise errors and omissions. We offer patients online information about the details of their stay in hospital and the opportunity to access their records online as well. In the NHS as a whole, that advantage of a unified system of records is that we've got comparable data across enormous swathes of the population that is much harder to guarantee if you've got your population divided between different insurers. And once you have that information about patients, you can use it to carry out the sort of research using, for example, genetic information that will enable future drugs to be personalized on the basis of people's genetic makeup so that we can target drugs and treatments at particular patients dependent on their genetic makeup, making more effective healthcare and saving money for the system. Research is fundamental to the future of the NHS and it's particularly supported by its model. With greater needs but less money, we can only continue to provide world-class care by finding the new drugs and the new techniques and using them as quickly as possible and as widely as possible then. So in conclusion, I am optimistic about the future of our National Health Service. I don't think we will protect it by keeping it in the same form that it is now, but rather by embracing opportunities to change. But one of the key assets for us is precisely that model of the NHS and the opportunities it provides. In the end, I'm one of those who would put the NHS as the thing I am most proud of in this country. The values which underpinned its birth, the model which runs it, I think are still enormously relevant today. Just to conclude then, I hope that we have some Breaking Bad fans uh, here today. If you are a fan of Breaking Bad, you will know the storyline. Walter White is a chemistry teacher in the US. He becomes ill with cancer. The only way that he can fund his treatment is through uh, using his chemistry skills to make drugs and to sell them. And uh, if you've watched the various series, you will know that this descends into a brilliant TV program and a nightmarish life. Uh, here is our version of Breaking Bad under the National Health Service. <coughs> The National, the National Health Service, a system that means you don't have to sell drugs in order to get healthcare treatment. What more could you want? Thank you very much. Um,